But my father was the head of the liquor board for quite a long time. And that's also the reason why I was able to travel in so many small um, towns within South Africa and understand the, Im the impact that things like alcohol had on, especially the, I mean, all communities, um, previously disadvantaged communities, but especially colored communities because it's such a, it's a given to SAP. And I remember my father taking us to these small towns and then ha having to teach people giving them a bean, two beans in, in two buckets, and then giving the one beer and giving the one water. And it was that simple that we would have to explain to people you cannot drink when you are pregnant. Because within colored communities, it was just a thing. So, I mean, I went to Da'ar when I was like maybe 12, 13 years old. I went there twice or three times. And Da'ar at that time had the highest birth rate of fetal alcohol syndrome children, predominantly colored, in the world, even though it's such a tiny town. And I mean, thinking back now, I can definitely understand why I was let into all of those spaces, is to make me really think about how coloreds were, or so-called coloreds, were weaponized within the structure of alcohol against black people and against ourselves. Um, I'm working on a concept called Papsak Propaganda. Um, the concept of the Papsak has always been something that enthralled me. I mean, as a colored, but also just as an artist. Because um, often as an artist, you also work for booze <laughs> at the beginning. I'm interested in propaganda. I'm interested in the way it's shaped our minds. And I'm interested in how propaganda can be used to reclaim certain spaces and things and ideas um, that's been taken away from us. I, I think a lot of people assume because I have, you know, certain um, perspectives on certain things about race and religion and all of that, that I somehow went to some kind of liberal institution. Um, but actually, I think resistance in this case is what made me quite different. I went to a very staunch Afrikaner school. Um, half of the kids' parents were wardens at Polesmore, so it was also a very specific type of Afrikaner. So every Monday and Friday we would come together and we'd sing a song um, which thanked Jan van Riebeek, it thanked 1652, it thanked the fact that Africa was here to be taken, and we thanked the concept of being claimed by white people. Um, and as a child, you know, you just sing it, you just sing it, you just sing it, and you know that it's, you know, probably not the truth, but you kind of have to do it because you're one of five in the class. Um, and then with post-traumatic stress, I think I just blocked it out of my mind. Um, and then I think quite recently someone sang the first sentence to me, and it, the rest of it just came, and I was like, Sis in doing five years, even gewoi, to come with me, my scapi, we're tough. And I was like, what? How do I know this? And then I thought, started thinking about concept of propaganda and stagnant knowledge and knowledge that's like fake memories and, and fake things implanted into children and how it sprouts as a seed and grows into this thing that you either resist or you go with and you don't ask questions about it. I went to primary school from 94 until 2000. And so, yeah, I would say the singing and all of that was probably 98 until about 2000. So I don't know, I love propaganda. I think it's very interesting and I want to understand how it's implicated me and touched me and my family and everyone I know, basically. When I was nine, we had to do this thing where they told us, okay, imagine you are in the ship that Jan van Riebeek came to South Africa with and you have to now write a letter to your mother to tell your mother um, where you are and how it's going. So to the white kids, I mean, that seems really normal. Oh my God, me and my blonde hair, I just came here to the new land. But me, they would have found me here. But now because I'm at that school, I have to write as if I'm also, I mean, if you're gonna think about it, I would have been the slave on the ship, but you know. So they made us take paper and then stain it with um, rooibos tea and then burn the edges so that it looks, you know, like a treasure trove letter. And then um, they kind of gave us options of what to write about. So I wrote, Deliver, live heaven, the father and mother. I'm writing to my parents about how 
governor Simon van der Saal met us at the harbor and then we went to a beautiful banquet at the castle. I've just made a fake one in 2018. So I took a giant piece of Fabrian and I burnt it and then I wrote this, they call it the Stichter song, so it's the Stichter Sliki, which is the song that Afrikaners would sing once they came and planted their little pole here. Um, and planted their pole in, into so many of us as well. But then on the flip side, they would also always take us every single year we would go to the castle. And they'd pile us all into the dungeon. That's one of my first experiences of school or memories of school, is paying one rand, when the one rand used to be this big, now I'm showing my age, and then they bundle you all into, have you been into the dungeon? That's the scariest thing. Most people go to the castle for the courtyard and the events and the nice things. But they used to literally pile us all into the dungeon um, and then close, there was only one window and the window's this big. So often people, if they were even in there for a minimum of eight weeks, they would start going, not blind, but their eyes would start going super sensitive. If you're there for a year, you're blind when you come out. So they would pile us all in there, close the door, close the window, and we'd all go, <coughs> you know, like, oh, but then if, you, if I think back on it now, I'm like, that is really traumatizing and really fucked up that we were put in the place where all the Khoisan were ke kept. If it wasn't their last resting place, it was definitely the place where they received the most trauma before they would meet their death or their end. And so I think that, that desensitization of, or that numbing of these are things to find funny or to indulge in, in a scary way, um, that's what I had to experience as a child in a predominantly white school. It wasn't about the history of thinking about it and honoring it and all of that. It was about honoring 1652, honoring Anne van der Riebeek, and then doing fake screams in the dungeon when they closed the window. I've only been to the dungeon once and I've never been back again because when I stepped in, I got this constricted feeling. I felt very tight and almost, you know, like, like you can't breathe. Even though the door was open, it was just an awful, awful feeling. And I thought, I've got to get out of here. So, I mean, I think two years ago, I was really, I was like hating white people. And that, in the way of how overtly I was performing that, and making that um, quite performative thing of distancing myself from it, I think is a quite natural thing when you come from that space, you come from your home space and then you go to that white space where you kind of either have to tone down or tone in or, or figure out how you fit into that space to completely rejecting that space. And I think I was going, we are all, I think the internet's enabled us to do it as well, collectively and together. Um, you go through that quite performative, anti everything that's not you anti that you can get lost in that as well if you're not careful and sometimes it's gratuitous that that rejection um you know just for the sake of it but i think it's something we have to go through maybe it was louder before but you tra you go through these phases like we said it's like a full circle and i think i'm at a space now where it's quiet i don't need to tap into it anymore when i do <laughs> you know, it's so that I can learn from it. So my favorite work of this whole show, um, it doesn't have a name yet. It's actually um, two colored women in a giant vat. Oh, like it's, it's kind of like in the Cape Malay way style, the plate with a VOC on it. And they're stepping on a giant bunch of grapes, kind of holding each other towards each other, but also pushing each other apart. The concept of being color changed dramatically for me when I came to Joburg. Because obviously I'm Cape Coloured and I was used to Cape Coloured type of shit. Um, which is quite clicky and quite different and quite racist and quite black hating. There's a lot of black hating within coloured communities, within my own fucking family. That energy between black and coloured people was something very rife to me in Cape Town. Like, it was what I understood to be the relationship between black people and coloured people. So cool. And then as soon as I moved to Joburg, it changed for me. I had never met Khaled who spoke Vanak, who spoke Zulu, who spoke Setswana, who dated black men. <laughs> like, it was more, it was just different. Where I think in Cape Town it's a very conscious decision to be nah. You know, saying Bantu, Daki, K-word, that type of shit in Cape Town is very rife. I mean, it's rife everywhere, but that is what I understood to be the engagement between colors and blacks. And so moving to get to Joburg really did change my perception of that as well. And it also made me, 
a way of seeing these things from the outside. It was easier for me to see the situation from the outside because I wasn't there anymore. And I just realized that colors were so weaponized and that they still hadn't realized it. A lot of, a lot of us still don't realize how all that prejudice and stuff, it's not natural. And it's something colored people quite play into quite easily because we like to be better or perceive ourselves to be better than black. We haven't acknowledged the one thing that can release us within anger, within everything, which is that a lot of colored people, we were brought here by rape. <laughs> like once we figure out the rape thing, we'll be able to figure out a way forward. You know, black people know who to be angry at. As colors, we still want to be pandering to the bus in a lot of situations. We still say, oh, it's nice if a child is light skinned and has blue eyes and stay la ara, you know? Um, within my own family, calling my uncle Idi Amin. He's literally like a bit dark, he looks like fucking, what's his name? Tiger Woods darkness, you know? Um, so that colorism, all of that stuff is just little things that were sprinkled by the whites just to keep us against each other. And I think that coming here really helped me to understand it more. Because we're always like half Italian, half German, um, and also like a butt of like Scottish. Really? How did that happen, bitch? Oh, did they live together as a happy family? No! A white man came to the hood maybe twice, came to see what you look like, and then never came back again. So also that thing of the rape, and then the fetishizing, and thinking that being fetishized makes you important, or makes, sets you apart. It's interesting to me. I have a work called bottle feeding, um, which, the study for it is so funny because people thought it was amoebas, like they thought it was, like that one. They thought like because it's just disembodied heads, and you know I'm quite literal in my thinking. Like I'm not trying to be Martin Creed and make a protrusion from the wall, and it symbolizes lots of things. That's literally just disembodied heads saping. All of them are saping. So all the heads are kind of like thrown back, and all the bottles are just like going straight into their beaker. Um, and then that was the study for it. But then the large work that I made. Um, it just looks like all of them are drinking late harvest, crackling, <laughs> autumn harvest. <laughs> People also don't know the history of alcohol and how it was implemented in a lot of ways. But with the DOP system, we were, as South Africans, we were pushed out. So we, no one bought wine from us, they basically bought grapes from us. Um, and with the pop suck vibe is, that would be the excess grapes, like the sweetest and the oldest and the most ripe from the top that the farmers would then make into wine here, so make a very cheap wine, and then just pay the laborers in that. For this painting, it's just um, a giant settler who is throwing a giant bottle over the face um, of what you assume to be a colored man or woman. It's actually a woman, sorry, it's got boobs. Um, I mean, men can have boobs too, but you know what I'm saying. Um, and so he's throwing it like over, over the face, and then that, that one, which is kind of like, you know, there's always one person that's weaponized against everyone else. And so that's also what I wanted to do. I wanted to, to be disembodied heads and they're kind of like nameless and faceless. And then one more important colored who's taking, he's drinking from the main bottle and then also bottle feeding the others. And it's about that coercion and about weaponizing ourselves against each other. And then in the background, there's, um, there's a settler ship coming with a, with a rainbow, Ubuntu. Rando Nation. <laughs> we are one. Simonier. But yeah, so, so the concept of we are all working together is impending doom and it's coming towards us. When I first moved to Joburg, there was a, you know, Mail and Guardian poster that said Lady Scully versus the art world. And I think whenever I am burnt out or sad or confused, it's usually when I assume myself to be part of the art world. So I've now come to the decision that I'm not part of the art world and that I do what I want um, because that's when I'm happiest and that's when the best work comes and it's when I don't feel um, obligated to be a specific type of artist or say specific things or... And so I think with this, um, I, I love um, crowdsourcing and, and um, doing focus groups where people can help me within my practice. And I think sometimes it's quite limiting when you are represented by a gallery or you imagine yourself to be a specific type of artist and you set yourself apart. And I think with this show, 
I have already put out a call where I'm asking everyone to, to write about it. And so, <laughs> literally, anyone, anyone, anyone who wants to write about the show can write about the show if they just contact me. Um, and I have a massive ass long list of lawyers, cashiers, designers, people who make furniture, my, the guy who reupholsters my stuff, my framer. <laughs> There's just like a lot of different people. Also the whole of Cedar, Cedar High in Mitchell's Plain is writing about it as well, like all colored kids from the hood. Like, and I think um, for a long time I used to think only, only people who are important in the art world should be writing about my work and conceptualizing it. And then I started realizing some of the most important um, like ways to perceive my work didn't come from art related people it came from normal people and so I think that's the show has really opened me up to that as well so I put out a massive call and now lots of people are going to be writing about my work I think I'm trying to show that there are many stories and that there are lots of forgotten stories especially within Khoisan culture of it being a culture of erasure um, because of the lot of things that we want to talk about does not exist anymore. So I think also uh, when I first went big with my work, I think it was also an act of trying to imagine it as cave drawings or as some kind of um, ode to cave drawings. Like it's a giant mural that you would see in a cave. And I also find that a lot of work um, pertaining to reclaiming of culture and of identity, ironically, is quite muted and, and creamy and black and white and browns. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I think also my work, with it being so much color and being it so violently colorful and almost garishly colorful and nauseatingly colorful, and it's almost like it's trying to overcompensate um, for what isn't there. That's a good one and I should remember it. <laughs> wow. That came out of me. Because <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a curator's love. <laughs>